CataractCoach.com, anti vitrectomy basics. A vitriol surgeon is going to teach you how to do a proper anti vitrectomy. From a sister channel, RetinaRounds.com. Check it out. Retina Rounds, episode number 99 Anterior Vitrectomy Basics. You've heard this before, but no matter how skilled a surgeon you may be, complications always happen. And one complication for cataract surgeons is posterior capsular violation requiring an anterior vitrectomy. Now, some of you have reached out and asked for a video on how to perform an anterior vitrectomy, and so today I'm going to give you a vitreoretinal specialist perspective on how to perform this procedure. There are a lot of great videos on this topic on Cataract Coach, and I would highly recommend that you check them out. Today we'll talk about some basic concepts of anterior vitrectomy, and for our next episode we'll go into more details on machine settings and fluidics. So with that said, let's dive right in. All right, so this is a resident performing uh, phacal emulsification on this relatively uh, dense cataract. You can see tripan blue staining has been used to stain the capsule, and a capsular rexus is initiated here. You can see as that capsular rexus is being extended out underneath the, uh, in the subincisional space, it looks like that rexus runs out a little bit, and a little maneuver is being attempted here, but that doesn't quite work. Eventually, the capsular rexus is continued by making a small nick, uh, and then continuing that 360. Now the lens material is being removed, and you can see here that as the, the nuclear fragments are being removed, there's a very bright red reflex there, and the capsular bag appears to be violated posteriorly. So let's just pause for a moment and talk about what you do at this moment. Obviously you've got a posterior capsular violation. Now the anterior hyaloid face may be intact and vitreous may not be coming forward. And in fact, that is the scenario in the surgery, but you'll see later on vitreous does come forward and an anterior vitrectomy is, is required. But what you want to do when you see that posterior capsular violation is you want to avoid enlarging that rupture. Uh, you want to avoid enlarging it, which may create a, a higher likelihood for uh, nuclear or cortical fragments to migrate into the posterior segment. And of course, if vitreous is coming forward, you want to avoid vitreous traction. So when you see this, the first and the most important piece of advice I can give you is to try and stay calm. This is not something that you expected. This is certainly not something that the patient expected, uh, but you have to stay calm so that everyone in the room stays calm and the patient also stays calm. And you can make better decisions if you're able to take a breath and try to salvage the situation. Now, when you see a posterior capsular violation, you don't want to remove your phacal emulsification probe. If you do that, the anterior chamber will shallow and vitreous will come forward. So you want to stay in the eye with your phacal emulsification probe. If you have any vitreous that's incarcerated in your probe, you want to reflux that out of your probe. And then you want to inject with your other hand uh, through your paracentesis some dispersive viscoelastic. You want, to, you want to inject that in front of the rupture, so anterior to the rupture site, but beneath any lens material. So that's going to help to tamponade and push back uh, or at least prevent any further vitreous from coming forward. At the same time, it's going to provide a barrier to prevent that lens material from migrating posteriorly. Now, once you've injected the viscoelastic, then you can slowly remove the phacal emulsification probe. Uh, and then I would recommend just closing the main incision. Even if it's a temporary close, it's better just to have a completely sealed uh, anterior chamber. Now you will have your paracentesis site that's still open and you're gonna create another paracentesis site that's going to accommodate your, bi accommodate your bimanual uh, anterior vitrectomy setup. So one hand will have the irrigation handpiece and one, um, one hand will have the vitrectomy handpiece. And while the staff is getting uh, the anterior vitrectomy set up, it's an opportunity for you to, again, take a breath, collect yourself, and also administer a little bit of extra anesthesia. Now, this surgery is obviously going to be longer than you anticipated, and so you want to make sure that the patient stays comfortable. Doing a little sub block can go a long way to making sure that at least the, uh, the patient is comfortable through this procedure. All right, so let's see what happens uh, in this case. Now, as, as I said before, the anterior hyaloid face has not been violated and vitreous hasn't at least visibly come forward. And so now what uh, the surgical team is doing is that they're mobilizing the residual lens fragment, that nuclear fragment, up into the anterior chamber so that the phacal emulsification probe can be used to remove that, uh, that nuclear fragment. You can see that that goes away nicely. And now there's still, of course, some cortical. Uh, there's an another little piece of nuclear fragment there. But you can see there's still some cortical uh, remnants uh, that are still there, and that needs to be addressed. So uh, here you can see some dispersive viscoelastic that's being injected to try to push that anterior hyaloid face back to create some space between the residual capsule and the cortex. Uh, and uh, now the phacal emulsification probe comes out. Uh, and now the, the surgeons are going to assess how much cortex is actually present. 
So you can see here going in with a, a it looks like a Sinsky hook, that iris is pushed back, not a whole lot of cortex there. Uh, superiorly, we can see inferiorly there's quite a bit of cortex that's still there. And so that needs to be removed. Now, at this stage, you could convert to an anterior vitrectomy and use a vitrectomy probe, but the surgeons have elected to use also a bimanual approach. This is a uh, sort of a decoupled IA handpiece. So the main uh, handpiece is irrigating while the side handpiece is aspirating that cortical material. And so you want to be really gentle if you're going to be doing this uh, because you obviously you don't want to further expand the, uh, the posterior caps defect. You don't want to encourage uh, that, uh, that uh, vitreous from coming forward or violate the anterior hyaloid face. And so you can see here now going through and now two different uh, paracentesis sites, that residual cortical material is being carefully uh, removed. But in the process, you can see, unfortunately, it looks like uh, there's uh, quite a bit of uh, a large posterior capsular defect. And the surgeons are suspecting at this point that Vitreous has in fact come forward. So how are you going to approach this problem? Now these are some uh, basics here on how to perform an anterior vitrectomy. Now uh, obviously uh, one of the key things here is to try to avoid any posterior migration of nuclear fragments. So you, if you do have any nuclear fragments, you want to mobilize those up into the anterior chamber and tuck them into the angle so that they're less likely to fall back. In this particular case, the nuclear fragments were already removed with the fake emulsification probe. And then you want to remove any vitreous, of course, that's migrated anteriorly. You need to clean up all of that anterior vitreous uh, so that you can maybe put in uh, a sulcus IOL. And in order to see the vitreous, you have to stain it. Uh, now you want to consider putting in some more viscoelastic to push any uh, uh, vitreous back. You want to try to decrease the likelihood for more vitreous coming forward, but you should also use triamcinolone here to stain the vitreous. It's going to allow you to see it much better. Uh, and I would recommend using a 1 to 4 dilution or even a 1 to 5 dilution of triamcinolone. You just need a light dusting of the vitreous. You don't want to have big clumps of triamcinolone that's going to actually obscure your view. Now, once you've done that, once you've uh, tamponaded the, uh, the, uh, the, the vitreous and stained the vitreous, you can then use your bimanual anterior vitrectomy setup to remove the nuclear and cortical remnants, and we'll get to what setting to use on the machine in just a moment. And once you've removed those nuclear and cortical remnants, then you can remove uh, any vitreous that is migrated anteriorly. Now, again, in this case, the, the, the uh, nuclear and cortical remnants were already removed with the uh, fake emulsification probe and the IA handpiece, and so we're going to go directly to the, uh, the anterior vitrectomy. So some pearls when performing an anterior vitrectomy. Now with one hand, you're going to be irrigating, uh, you're going to be infusing BSS into the anterior chamber, and you want to keep that irrigation level lower um, so that you're not um, overly uh, deepening the anterior chamber, you're not pushing a lot more BSS into the posterior segment, that high, that's going to encourage, it's going to hydrate the, the vitreous, it's going to encourage it to come forward. And you want to uh, try to uh, um, point the irrigation handpiece away from the capsule rupture. Again, trying to decrease the likelihood of hydrating the vitreous or encouraging more vitreous from coming forward. When you are using your vitrectomy handpiece in the other hand, you want to keep that vitrectomy port up. Keep it up towards the cornea. You don't want to point it down to the posterior segment. That's just going to draw more vitreous up. You just want to clean up the vitreous that's in the anterior chamber. So start by keeping the vitrectomy port up towards the cornea, and then you can tilt it at a 45, even a 90 degree angle to try to engage any of the vitreous that's in the anterior chamber. Now, while you're moving around with the vitrectomy handpiece, move slowly. You don't want to do any sudden movements. Use the fluidics of the vitrectomy handpiece in your favor. Let the vitreous come to you. When you see that the vitreous is no longer coming to the handpiece, then you can move the handpiece towards the stained, um, the stained vitreous. And you want to be careful as you're moving that handpiece around that you are very careful around the iris. Now, iris, when you're, if you're using a high, a high vacuum, Iris can easily pop into the, in the, into the mouth of the vitrectomy uh, handpiece, and you'll have an iris defect that you'll have to contend with. So just be careful as you're cleaning up around the iris. And if you are in this process of removing nuclear cortical fragments and some of those fall back, don't go chasing after them. You're just going to create more problems in the posterior segment. It's just going to worsen the patient's outcome. At that point, if, if pieces fall to the back, and if there are nuclear pieces or significant uh, pieces of cortex, You'll just have to refer this patient to a retina specialist to perform a clean, complete vitrectomy. Chasing after those, uh, those, those pieces um, uh, through an anterior approach is just going to be a setup for a retinal tear and potentially a detachment.
And then again, you want to be patient with the vitrectomy. Go slowly. This doesn't. This isn't a race. Just be thorough in cleaning up uh, all the vitreous that's in the anterior chamber. And you'll know that there's vitreous that's in the anterior chamber, not only through the staining with triamcinolone, but if you hear a ding, that occlusion ding on the machine, you'll know that vitreous is still present. So let's talk a little bit about the settings on the, on the foot pedal. So you have basically three basic modes. You have IA cut, anterior vitrectomy and cut IA. So let's start with IA cut. IA cut is what you're gonna to use to remove nucleus and cortex material. So position one on your foot pedal is going to turn the infusion on. Position two is going to engage the aspiration only on the vitrectomy handpiece. And then position three is going to engage the cutter. So the idea here is you start in position one to, uh, to uh, inflate the anterior chamber. Then with the, uh, in position two, you can aspirate those nuclear pieces or those cortical pieces into a safe place, where then you can go into position three, engaging the vitreous cutter and removing uh, those pieces. And we'll talk about the specific settings that I would recommend for this step in our next episode. Now, the anterior vitrectomy mode is a little bit different. That's really, it does, that's really designed for you to be able to remove vitreous. So in position one, the infusion is going to turn on, and in position two, the vitreous cutter is going to turn on with a linear control of aspiration. So as you go down on that foot pedal, you're gonna ramp up from zero, uh, no, uh, no aspiration, up to whatever your preset level is uh, for, um, for flow and vacuum. Uh, and then finally, cut IA, very similar to anterior vitrectomy, except you've got position one infusion on, position two vitreous cutter on, and then position three is where you have your aspiration on. So I, cut IA and anterior vitrectomy are very similar. Most surgeons opt to just use the anterior vitrectomy so that as you depress down on the foot pedal, again, you have linear control of your aspiration. All right, so let's see where we are in the case. You can see the, uh, the IA handpiece is still in the eye. And now some triamcinolone is being injected into the anterior chamber, sort of mechanically trying to mix that triamcinolone around. And now with some BSS swirling that uh, triamcinolone, you can see there's quite a bit of uh, anterior vitreous. And so now the surgeons have uh, converted to performing an anterior vitrectomy. You can see uh, on the left, the uh, irrigation handpiece as being directed, the, you see the, the os of that irrigation handpiece is directed into the anterior chamber, not posteriorly. And then the vitrectomy probe is being used cut her mouth up towards the cornea and any of that stained vitreous is being removed uh, very carefully moving around in the anterior chamber. You can see that there's some vitreous that's uh, actually incarcerated in the uh, paracentesis site where the infusion cannula is, so that'll have to be uh, taken out. All throughout, you can see here, triamcinolone is being used. The vitreous is not uh, readily uh, visible unless that triamcinolone is, triamcinolone is in the eye. So very nice use here. And you can see that, that uh, the, the cutter probe, even earlier the irrigation, the irrigation probe was being used to sort of sweep that vitreous out of the wound, the, the main wound, and now the paracentesis site. And that vitreous is being uh, trimmed back, staying in the anterior chamber. You don't want to go back into the posterior segment and try uh, to, um, to encourage more uh, vitreous from coming into the anterior chamber. And so now the uh, hand pieces have been reversed, so the cutter is now on the left and the irrigation hand piece is on the right, and now uh, uh, more vitreous is being cleaned out, uh, again keeping that cutter mouth up and slowly going around uh, to remove uh, any residual vitreous. It's looking, looking like it's really significantly improved here, a lot less vitreous than there was at the beginning of the case. All right, so now the anterior vitrectomy looks like it's done, and the surgeons are checking to see what kind of capsular support there appears uh, to be for potentially a secondary lens, a little bit more triamcinolone in the anterior chamber. It doesn't look like there's any vitreous here. So the surgeons are, are gonna go ahead and implant a sulcus lens here. That uh, main wound is enlarged uh, to accommodate this three-piece IOL. The uh, IOL is injected into the anterior chamber. Good idea here. You don't want to try to deliver this directly into the sulcus. You might get into some trouble if you can't clearly see where that anterior capsule is. So start by putting that lens into the anterior chamber and then dialing those haptics. You can see here that those haptics are being placed superiorly and inferiorly away from the capsular defect that's present in the subincisional space. So that's going to give this lens the greatest amount 
of stability. Now you could leave this patient aphakic if there were uh, if there were significant lens uh, fragments in the posterior segment. If, segment, if you're expecting that a vitreoretinal surgeon might have to do a vitrectomy, you could just leave the patient aphakic and then allow the vitreoretinal surgeon uh, to uh, implant the lens at the time of the vitrectomy. Some vitreoretinal surgeons prefer, prefer the uh, anterior segment surgeons to go ahead uh, and, uh, and place a lens. So it's really uh, up to you and, and uh, what your vitreoretinal colleagues prefer. This is a very good idea here. Uh, the surgeons are going, going ahead and closing the, uh, the main corneal wound with a uh, tenonylon suture. And the risk for uh, both CME and, uh, and ophthalmitis, uh, retinal tears, retinal detachments, all that goes up. Uh, and so particularly with respect to endophthalmitis, good idea to go ahead and close that clear corneal wound uh, to, further, to just try to decrease that risk as much as possible. And now with the lens in place, you can see that they've reintroduced the vitrectomy probe. This is just being used to remove any residual viscoelastic in the anterior chamber, of course. Some tramcinolone is being used to confirm that there's no vitreous in the AC and that looks nice and clean. This is a really nice job of salvaging uh, what could have been a potentially uh, a very a much more complicated situation. And just to recap here are some of the final steps. Uh, you do, again, want to confirm that there's no uh, vitreous in the anterior chamber or to the wound, and you can do that uh, through a number of ways. Uh, most commonly, tramcinolone will be injected uh, just to confirm, but you can also use a cyclodialysis spatula to try to sweep near the paracentesis or, or uh, corneal wounds. The, the downside of this, though, is that if there is vitreous there, you may be pulling on the vitreous and increasing the likelihood of, of, of traction on, on the retina and potentially create a retinal break. Now, myocol is another really good idea here that's going to help to uh, constrict the pupil, stabilize the lens if, you, if you've uh, put in a sulcus lens just to keep that lens in place, but also if you see a peaked pupil that can give you a clue that there's still some vitreous that needs to be addressed. And lastly, I know that some surgeons use a, a Wexel to try to test the wound to see if there's any residual vitreous, but I would, I would advocate against that since if there is any vitreous, it could potentially put uh, too much traction on, on the retina. So in addition to checking for any vitreous in the AC, also a good idea to inject some intracameral antibiotics. Again, the risk for endophthalmitis goes up and that may help to decrease that risk. And since both triamcinolone and viscoelastic have been injected into the eye, and not all of that has been removed uh, typically at the time of uh, anterior vitrectomy, you should definitely consider giving some either IV or some uh, uh, oral diamox in the postoperative area to try to decrease the risk for any IOP spikes. Finally, in the postoperative period, it's important to have a discussion with the patient about what happened. You definitely don't want to keep this a secret. So disclose what happened to the patient. Tell them about how you were able to uh, mitigate any further complications. And be sure to monitor them very closely in that postoperative period. When complications happen, patients will feel far more reassured if their surgeon is right there by their side. So you want to run towards patients who have complications. You don't want to run away from them. And again, you want to monitor them for any signs of endophthalmitis, retinal detachment, CME, uh, and lens destabilization. And whenever uh, there has been a violation of the, of the posterior capsule, I would highly recommend referring these patients to a retina specialist, even if there aren't any uh, fragments in the posterior segment. Just a good idea to have a retina specialist on board to thoroughly check uh, the posterior segment and address uh, any posterior segment pathology that may have arisen. All right, I hope you found this review to be helpful. And stay tuned tomorrow. We'll go over more details on uh, machine settings and fluidics. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please visit us at retinarounds.com. There you can sign up for our email list. You'll get a notification every time a new video is posted. And if you have an interesting video or a tip or trick that you'd like to share, please follow the links on our website and you can upload your video there. Thanks so much for watching.